All right, <clears throat> so we're going to start our first lecture today, or the first part of a big lecture series, is what I'm calling it. So there'll be multiple lecture time periods to get through these PowerPoint slides. This is basically your introduction to biology and evolutionary thought and scientific method, the basis of biology. So again, just to let you know, my name is Dr. Richard Messer, or Professor Messer, and I've been at Western for 18 years, and I look forward to um, get you started on your path down, hopefully, a, a wonderful career in biology or whatever areas of life sciences that you may choose, whether that means going on to medical school or physical therapy or nursing or whatnot. Um, getting this basic understanding of biology will be helpful for you, particularly understanding the scientific method and evolutionary thought. You might not realize this unless you came from a really strong biology background, that evolution is key to understanding biology and actually a lot of different things. But we'll get more into that. But first, um, let's talk a little bit about what zoology is. Obviously, zoology is any kind of introductory course you might run across um, represents the study of animals. And so zoology is the study of animals, and it is a subfield in the biological sciences or biology. So biology is the bigger umbrella that would include things like botany, microbiology, zoology. Just about any kind of area that involves living organisms is a kind of a concept under the umbrella of biology. I would even argue things like psychology is a type of biology that deals with human behavior. Or nursing or medical doctors are applied biology dealing with um, using the principles that we get in a biology class in physiology to help deal with healthcare issues. So I don't consider them separate from the big umbrella of biology because biology, by definition, is the study of life. And we think about just about everything that we care about is alive. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started. I want to press upon you that you are becoming academics, scholars, and as such, you need to have an open enough mind to at least appreciate concepts and arguments and ideas that may not be comforting, may not be part of your belief system. But you at least need to be brave enough, strong enough to hear them out, appreciate what may or may not be correct, you decide and become a truly educated person. Enlightenment isn't just going off and meditating, you know, some people take drugs to get enlightened. But hard study and thinking is also a type of enlightenment as well. So I realize um, on your journey, and you've been doing this journey for a while, and now it's be hopefully becoming more self-directed as the longer you go in your education, that um, <clears throat> we don't have all the answers. No professor has all the answers. Your parents don't have all the answers. Your religious leaders don't have all the answers. Celebrities certainly don't have all the answers. And so you're gonna be having to navigate and figure out what is correct at least factually and what is true for your own personal philosophy. As you probably heard the statement before, you can have your own opinions, but don't, but don't realize you can't have your own facts. So what is science trying to do? It's not just a bunch of facts. It's actually trying to make sense of the world, just like a lot of other fields try to make sense of the world. Humanities try to make sense of the world, or does try to make sense of the world. Artists try to make sense of the world too, but from maybe slightly different perspectives. Science tries to make sense of the world, particularly in regards 
to, in the case of biology, life. And that can encompass just about anything from behavior to growth, reproduction, physiology. Um, and it can have a major impact on different fields, particularly evolutionary concepts, as we'll get into a little bit down the road. So again, I don't expect any of you to necessarily feel bad, uncomfortable, or even mad, but we're gonna talk about evolution. And if you came from a certain background where they maybe kept you from learning about evolution or appreciating it, you might be bothered by it. It doesn't mean you have to change your religious beliefs or anything like that. But understanding things and your growth will affect how you see the world. There's no doubt about that. So no, understand no one knows everything or has absolute truth. At the end of the day, you need to figure things out for yourself. At the end of the day, I do not care what you believe when it comes to beliefs, but I do care about good arguments, thoughtful discussion, intellectual pursuit that is legitimate. So again, my goal is to open up new ideas and expand your range of knowledge, and maybe it'll change your personal philosophy some. <clears throat> All people are gonna try to influence you. The media tries to influence you. Politics try to influence you. We know that all too well. Religion tries to influence you. Um, salespeople try to influence you. Your friends try to influence you. Try to rise above the influence and at least appreciate, use metacognition to think about why you consider things real or not real. And be willing to throw something out if it isn't correct. Be willing to accept that you will not know everything. You will not know absolute truth. But that you may be able to get an approximate truth. So you have an, a, not a chance. You got, let's be, let's just kind of have this ex, mental experiment for a minute. You can have a small bag of facts that are relatively concrete that you've worked out, you've looked at lots of sources. In this small bag, you can really count on most of those ideas being mostly correct. Or you can have a huge bag where you throw everything in and most of it isn't correct. So do you want a big bag of knowledge where most of it isn't correct? Or would you rather have a small bag of knowledge where most things are more correct? And so I choose the smaller bag where I accept that I really don't know much of anything. And what I do know of, at least I have some concrete basis for. Now remember, your ideas are based on your experience and based on the influences of others. You cannot imagine, there's so many things that have influenced who you are today walking into this classroom. Had you been raised in a different time, a different place, a different culture, with a, loving parents, without loving parents, with a good education, without a good education, good peers, not so good of peers, you know, all those things have influenced you, sometimes in a positive way, sometimes in a negative way. Even negative experiences can sometimes be positive. So a lot of your ideas are built on what you are told to believe, by people that you love. They're your authority figures. And I understand why you may want to accept most of the things that they present to you. But again, question everybody at some level. Even if you don't do it in a rude way and you might just keep it to yourself. Question me. I don't have absolute truth. Question your textbook. Question anybody that presents themselves as an authority. And most importantly, question yourself. Why do you believe what you do? Does that mean that you're completely correct? So question everything. Because remember, ultimately, the unexamined life, many would argue, is not worth living. So what about science and religion? Obviously, that's uh, two areas that are important to society. 
Some people might argue that science is becoming the new religion. Just remember that religion and science come with different rules. Science is supposed to be about the natural world, what we can actually measure and understand. While religion it can be more open to interpretation and faith without necessarily having direct um, information that demonstrates it. And so let me explain a little bit how science works. Science is more like being a detective. As a detective, you go to a crime scene, somebody who has been murdered. What does detective do? They collect evidence. They collect samples. They analyze the samples. And from there, they start to piece together how this murder may have happened. They weren't there, so they don't know for sure with 100% certainty how something might have happened. But they collect enough evidence that they can build a strong enough argument that they could put together how someone may have been killed. Science is also like being a mechanic. If a car needs to be fixed, what does the mechanic do? The mechanic opens up the car and looks for around for um, possible reasons why it's not turning on properly. Now, <clears throat> again, what is the what did the detective do and what did the, the mechanic do? They both focused on real data that was in front of them. As a scientist, I have to follow those same rules. Scientists do speculate where did life come from? Physicists speculate where did the universe come from? The idea of the Big Bang, for instance, is the idea that um, <clears throat> at one time the universe didn't exist as we see it. It was infinitely small beyond imagination. And then something sparked it, and eventually we had everything that's around us. How do they get some of the evidence for that? Well, scientists with their telescopes, for instance, and sophistication that's well beyond what I know, because I'm not a physicist or astrophysicist, but they can look at galaxies and see that they're moving away from each other, suggesting that they had a common uh, direction and, and expanded from that. So when you look at a universe, they know the universe is moving apart. The idea is that the universe could continue to expand indefinitely to the point where you can't see galaxies anymore with a telescope. So that's the kind of evidence they have. And, and then they do things like have the, <clears throat> you know, the machine to collide, where they do the colliding. Um, Again, that might give them evidence for what happens at the Big Bang. So they have some ideas of what, they don't know all the evidence. They weren't there, nobody was there. But they have some ideas, again, based on trying to be that detective pulling up some data. That's also true when we try to figure out um, where did life come from. Nobody was there when life started. Now, a religious person might just say, ultimately, God did it. Scientists aren't necessarily ruling that out. They're just trying to provide a natural explanation. And it's not much different than what the detective does or the mechanic. What does the detective do? Well, you can make this argument that, you know, you feel really bad. Let's go back and forth. Let's start with the mechanic. You can have this feeling like, I've been having a string of bad luck. My car's not working because I had some bad thoughts, did something mean to my neighbor, and I was cursed. Now, the mechanic, he doesn't know that's true or not. From a faith-based perspective, you might think it is true. 
But what does the mechanic do? Oh, your alternator isn't working. That's why the car isn't charging, and that's why the battery isn't charging, and why it isn't starting. That's all the mechanic can tell you. That doesn't mean that this other stuff didn't have some kind of effect, but he can't prove that, or she can't prove that. As a detective, that's the same thing. They gathered evidence. They don't know, they have an idea of how the murder happened, but they don't know if there was some kind of evil curse that caused it to happen. So religion is more based on a belief or a faith that may not be testable because we can't really test the supernatural. Doesn't mean that the supernatural doesn't exist, but the ability as a scientist at this point is pretty limited to just being able to measure you know, the weight of something, the DNA of something. We'll get into more of the evidence of evolution later, but that's what I want you to try to understand. Does that mean that religion is important? Obviously, religion has helped societies form, bring people together. Morality is often determined more through religion, while science, for the most part, doesn't handle morality. Science is, again, supposed to be trying to understand things, but it isn't, um, has a different purpose. You're not going to go um, get baptized in the Church of Science. <laughs> if you understand what I mean, while the religious church, yes, it brings the community together. So it's just different points. But the point is, there has been time, what is the whole point of all this? There's been times in our culture where science and religion seem to be at odds with one another and sometimes affects whether people accept the idea of evolution, for instance. So just realize both of them have a value in understanding the human condition. So both science and religion are valuable to some people. Just realize science cannot accurately measure the supernatural. It cannot determine the existence of a God or the non-existence of a God. It's just beyond the ability of science to measure. Similarly, evolution is not, it's just a scientific explanation to the origin of species and the origin of life to some degree. It is worthy of study. It's a very invaluable tool to being a biologist. So a person can have a religious belief and still be a scientist. They could be an evolutionist and still be religious, still believe in a God. Again, this is outside of my purview for this class, whether you believe in a God or not. That's not what I'm here to sell you. I'm here to sell you. Accept the idea that evolution is a tool that can be useful for appreciating the different species around us. If you look at birds, let's look at waterfowl like ducks, and geese, and an eagle. What looks more similar to each other? The duck and the eagle, or the duck and the goose? Well, I'm sure most of you would all agree that the duck and the goose look more similar to each other. They're both waterfowl, have similar types of feet and bills. That's because they have shared a more common recent ancestor. So they're more related to one another than um, those two birds are to an eagle. So again, there is a tool there for helping appreciate things. We'll assume that the duck and the goose behave more similar to, similarly to each other as well. That just looks similar. What helps us to understand that? Evolution. So again, science relies on the scientific method to interpret the universe. And I imagine that you've at least been exposed to the scientific method in your high school biology classes. The scientific method observes the world around you directly or in reference to other people's observations. You make predictions and hypotheses about the, how the observations work. You devise an experiment or study to interpret the observations. You record data and decide if your observation is correct. And if so, others will test you and your hypothesis. If it stands the test of time, 
it becomes a theory. So a hypothesis, science is driven by hypothesis. It's a statement that can be tested. And then you do your experiments or your study, write up your conclusions, and then other scientists can try to see if you're correct or not. And then they'll write up their studies. And if it holds up, then it becomes a theory. So a theory isn't just somebody's idea like it is commonly used in roundabout way. We don't have, well, my theory is that this is blah, blah, blah. Or my uncle thinks this and that's his theory. That's the layperson's idea of theories and that's very flimsy. While a scientific idea of theory is hypothesis that stood the test of time through lots of different studies and is considered almost like a fact. That's how serious science takes theories. So an example of how to do the scientific method is maybe let's generate a hypothesis. My hypothesis is that people that drive Corvettes drive faster, or let's just say sports cars in general, drive faster than people that own minivans as a general rule. Now we know there's gonna be some people with the lead foots that drive a minivan, and we know there's gonna be some people that probably pamper their sports car. But I'm making the argument that on average, people that buy sports cars are gonna drive them a lot faster than people that drive minivans. That's just my hypothesis. So I'm gonna test that hypothesis. How do I test that hypothesis? So I ask you, how would you set up an experiment or a study? Does it have to be direct observations? But let's say we do direct observations. What we could do is sit outside near a highway with a radar gun and watch sports cars go by, record our results. We can record minivans going by and record our results. We try to do it at the same time, same place. Get lots of observations because the more observations you have, the more accurate we are. And maybe we find out that people that drive sports cars on highways are going 15 miles per hour faster than people that drive minivans. Do we know why? Well, we have to ask more questions to figure out why, but we can speculate sports cars tend to have bigger horsepower. People that drive them may want may have more of an ego. Or people that have minivans might have kids in them and they want to drive more carefully. These are all possible reasons. How's another way to test this that doesn't require direct observation? Well, maybe we go down to the courthouse and we look at speeding tickets and see who gets more speeding tickets. That would provide indirect evidence that we did not directly observe that maybe somebody speeds more than another person. And then what about, um, so those, those are just different ways. So that is our hypothesis. We tested it, we have our results, and then we um, run with it, so to speak. Does that mean that universally this is true? Well, it's true for this street. Maybe it's different um, in Iowa. Maybe it's different in the Northwest. Maybe it's different in Canada. We've got to realize that our science is based on the observation of a region and the limitations of it. Anyway, that gives you some ideas of how the scientific method works. So again, this is important. Science is a hypothesis-driven field. That's what makes a hard, something a hard science. You make your observations. I saw, I saw some sports cars driving by quickly. I asked some questions. Do sports cars drive faster than minivans? I say, yes, sports cars will on average drive faster than minivans. So that's my prediction to test that hypothesis. If I go out and I find out that with my speed gun over several days and lots of different observations that there is no difference, that minivans and sports cars drive equally fast, 
on average, because you got to do an average, you don't just make one observation. It's important to do lots of observations. Then I have to say there, accept the, the idea of what we call a null hypothesis and say there's no difference. And then I'd probably not pursue that science anymore or go on and pursue something else, try to figure out why you, there is no difference. And again, if my tests hold up over the test of time and become strong, we can call that a theory. Now the difference between a controlled experiment and a comparative method. The controlled experiment is going out to the highway, taking your speed gun and directly measuring the results. The comparative method is when I went down to the courthouse and collected the results and compared the two. So both are valuable. One is indirect observations. Maybe police officers just happen to biasly pick out sports cars than minivans. That's possible. There's evidence that, um, you know, if you have a certain type of sports car, you're more likely to be picked out than others. So, Here's an example of a scientific study using the hypothesis and prediction model. Scientists are seeing that amphibians are declining dramatically in many places. So scientists observed that amphibian populations are declining seriously in some parts of the world, but not in others. Observations have also showed that declines were greater in mountains than in adjacent lowlands. So what is the reason for this? Why do you think that, so we know that amphibians are actually going through a major decline in the world. What is the reason for that? Obviously the first thing you might think of is environment. But why in this particular study that, that they saw that the declines are greater in mountains than in lowlands. So this is what an example of a scientific study that was made. The question was asked, why are amphibians declining greater at high elevations than at low elevations? Why are amphibians declining in some regions but not in others? And so what would you think is the reason? So we formulate a hypothesis, and this is the hypothesis that these scientists had used. They predicted that there were environmental factors such as um, in the summer having higher levels of ultraviolet light. You know, ultraviolet light can be very damaging to skin and can cause serious harm, particularly ultraviolet light B. And so the prediction is because of higher altitudes, UV light is worse, that that may explain why amphibians are declining. They're declining because there is an increase in UVB radiation. That's the hypothesis. So what would your, your prediction be? If you reduced UV light, the development and survival will be better. So they're going to test this hypothesis, the response of tadpoles of two frogs living in the Australian mountains were compared. One species had disappeared from the high elevations, Natura, and the other, Prinia, had not. Scientists predicted that the um, tadpoles would survive less than the other tadpoles if exposed to UVB light. And these experiments um, confirm this observation as I'll show you in the next slides. Individuals of both species survived well when raised in tanks with filters that blocked the UV light. So here's our hypothesis. This, the susceptibility of UV radiation had contributed to the disappearance of some frogs from high elevation ponds. So this is the experiment that they're developing. That, so again, this is their, 
observations, they found that this species of frog had a higher probability of dying um, when, look at the different colors, you have unfiltered sunlight, filtered UV light blocked, and filtered UV light allowed. So what do we see? Well, we see that unfiltered sunlight and UVB light allowed to go through kill more frogs than filtered light. We see that for this species of frog and we see it for the other species of frog. Look at this one. Both the unfiltered light and the UVB radiation light killed more frogs than if we blocked the UV light. So here we are providing the sunscreen, so to speak, which was just a shield put over the pond. So we have this pond. We put this shield that blocks the dangerous levels of UV light and the frogs survive. But if we let the sunlight come through or, the, um, or we don't filter the UVB light, we see that the probability of the frogs dying is much greater. And this is true at both altitudes. In fact, the higher altitudes, we see more mortality. Look at that. We have almost 100% mortality here. While in the lower altitude, you don't see as much mortality. So that's the differences between these two experiments. See, this is at 1,300 meters. This is at 1,600 meters. But the UV light seems to be very damaging, particularly for this species. So some species of frogs do better with UV light than others. So this particular species, Latoria, um, Baroxia, or something like that, dies and is much more susceptible to UV light than this Crinia signiferia. So anyway, that shows you how the scientific method was used to help determine that UV light, particularly in high elevations, is more likely to kill this frog species. So that's how an experiment was done in, in nature. So going back to biology now, so we talked a little bit about the scientific method. Now we're gonna move over to biology. What is life? We, most of us know when something's alive. Life can be defined, and this is important, life can be defined as an organized genetic unit capable of metabolism, reproduction, and evolution, and is generally considered to be made of cells. So everything that we know of that's living for the most part on Earth has these characteristics, all of these characteristics. And so, for instance, a virus might replicate, but it's not alive. Cells, it has to be made of cells, has to reproduce, live on its own, have its own metabolism. What do we mean by metabolism? An organism's metabolism is this chemical activity that consists of literally thousands of individual chemical reactions, so that's biochemistry. That metabolism is what is happening in your body right now, happening in my body, happening in your pets. The metabolism is causing you to digest a meal. Do all the different chemical reactions in your cell that allows you to live, make more ATP, keep your body at homeostasis. So all these reactions are needed and the genes are involved in the control and coordination of it. Genes are of course found on DNA inside the nucleus of a cell. Your organism needs to be able to maintain its internal environment relative to, to the external environment. And we call this homeostasis. Homeostasis is the maintenance of a relatively stable internal conditions such as temperature. Reproduction, of course, is um, alters and increases variation 
what I mean by variation, well, you and your brother and your sister all look a little bit different from each other, even though your mom and dad reproduced to make you all. There's differences due to the genes combinations that each of you got. Evolution interacts with this variation. If there's positive traits, they're more likely to survive than less capable traits. And we'll talk more about what that all means. And we call that biological evolution. The difference among living animals that enabled them to live in the different environments and, and adapt different lifestyles or adopt different lifestyles are called adaptations. So a polar bear is adapted to living in the Arctic. A black bear lives well in the 48, lower 48 states. Uh, there's desert gerbils that don't need to drink water. These are all examples of adaptation that were caused by evolution. Let's start with the idea that most scientists and the understanding of science is that the universe is very old. Nobody knows for sure how old it is. But we're talking you know, billions, if not trillions of years. And again, the fact that the universe is constantly expanding gives us the idea that the that it's moving at what rate it occurred and how it happened. We, for instance, know that the speed of light, um, the light traveling from the sun to the earth takes eight minutes. So that means the light that comes from a star must be even millions of miles away. We're able to calculate that. And we're able to calculate what a lot of the different stars and planets are made up of. So this gives you an idea that things are millions of years away, light years away. So the, so the universe must be very old. Let's take a moment and take a look at this YouTube video. Or not. I'll take a, I'll give you these in a moment. Okay, so I'll give you these videos to watch in a moment. So the idea is that the Earth is very old. So let's imagine that we made the Earth um, equivalent to a calendar month. So let's, so the idea of the Earth might be 8 billion years old, 4 to 8 billion years old, excuse me. And we're going to put this all within a 30 day calendar period. That means on the first day the Earth was formed, um, for roughly 4 billion years ago or whatever the time frame might have been, we know that there was no life on the planet. And then around day three, we start to see the origins of life. So how do we know about that? I'll get to that a little bit later, but the idea is um, some of the primitive chemicals that we needed on earth existed and then a spark helped um, create some of the simple molecules. Now nobody really knows completely what was the origin of life but how do we know um, the oldest fossils and things like that? If you're familiar with the earth and the shell and if you're looking at something like the Grand Canyon and you see all the different layers of rock. We know in the different layers of rock, different fossils can be found. So at the top, where something's died, we see the first several layers of sediment, fossils of animals that look similar to ourselves. While if you go further down into the sediment, you start to not see those animals or plants. And eventually we get to this single-celled type organism. So that gives you an idea 
of what showed up. Not everything just appeared at once, not based on the fossil record. So the idea is that the oldest fossils begin to show up around day seven. Before that, it's just bacteria floating around in the ocean. Then the bacteria evolved the ability for photosynthesis. And I'm gonna get them to provide you a video to help with this uh, concept. And then we're still talking about bacteria into the third week on the calendar. So that means nothing, if you went back to the earth on day 14, you would not recognize it as the earth. You just see some green algae and things like that floating around in cells. It's not till day 20 that we see the eukaryotic cells. Now, what is a eukaryotic cells? These are what we mean by true cells, cells that make up organisms like ourselves. And it's not even till day 24 that we see multicellular organisms. That means 23 days went by before we saw anything where more than one cell was joined together into something that looked like an organism that was more than one cell. Day 27, we begin to see abundant plants and aquatic life. Day 28, we see our first land plants and first land animals. Day 29, we start to see um, forests that were able to form the coal. The first mammals show up on day 29 and the dinosaurs are dominant. Dinosaurs go extinct and we start to see birds and flowering plants and the rise of mammals. And it's not even until the last 10 minutes on the 30 day calendar that we begin to see humans. So that means humans, hominids, there's lots of different types of species of human actually that existed, that no longer exist, showed up the last 10 minutes based on the best we can put together of looking at the fossil record. Humans have been around maybe 100,000 years. The Earth has lived, existed for as best as we can determine for 4 billion years. And before you go saying, well, how do scientists know? Were they there? Again, remember, a detective isn't at a crime scene to see the murder. They collect the evidence and they determine that a murder had occurred and how it may have occurred. That's all science is able to do, is piece together. And based on looking at the fossil record, from a lot of very scary smart scientists, this is what we basically understand. I'm sure it's more advanced than this. This was, this actually, this calendar was made in 2004. So again, looking at the major events in the history of life on Earth, life arose from non-life. Uh, chemical evolution took place first that led to life about four billion years ago. And then around 3.8 billion years, we begin to see the first simple molecules and compartments or cells. Cells capture energy and light. Two billion years, we start to see oceans filled with prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are bacteria. You don't see any other living organisms. Then those prokaryotes, that bacteria become photosynthetic. So they, look, they begin to look like algae. They take on the ability to capture sunlight and change the atmosphere to an oxygen-filled atmosphere. Before that, animals can't live. It changes the ozone and provides protective layer against UV light. That takes place 800 million years ago. Prokaryotic cells um, become large enough to engulf each other, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, and that's called the endosymbiotic theory. And then life that we kind of begin to recognize is 1.5 million years ago. We start to see eukaryotic cells, those with a true nucleus. By the way, what is the endosymbiotic theory? 
it's the idea that bacteria were engulfed by a cell that ate it, but didn't destroy it. And then they developed a symbiotic relationship where they began to live with one another. So the idea is that the mitochondria in your cells was originally a bacteria that now lives inside your cells. It has DNA. That's why they think it was a, a, its own separate cell, its own bacteria. Interestingly enough, all the mitochondria in your body is passed down by the mother lineage, the female lineage. We'll get back to that a little bit later again. But the eukaryotic cells and the formation of mitochondria inside them through this endosymbiotic theory allowed for multicellular organisms to form. And then this ultimately can lead to animals and plants and ultimately us. <clears throat> Life also discovered the ability to have sex. And sexual recombination allowed for variation to occur. You know, take half of your mother, half your father, mix it together, and you have a, traits that are different. You're not just a perfect blend of your mother and father. Neither is your brother or your sister, so you have variation that forms. So I'm a little taller. All this increases evolutionary rate allowing for the diversity of life that we see on this planet. <clears throat> so I'm going to pause there for now, and then we will continue this lecture. Okay, so let's go ahead and finish up um, this lecture for today. Um, you'll notice that um, what we have here is the levels of organization of life. Biology can be visualized as a hierarchy of units that include molecules, cells, tissues, organs, organisms, populations, communities, and the biosphere. And each one of these levels can be dramatically different than the previous level. So to understand the organisms, biologists must study them at all levels of organization from low to high and realize each level of organization can be infinitely more complex than the previous one. So if you have a bunch of atoms <coughs> that, that excuse me, little touch of the COVID, just joking, of course. Atoms can form molecules. Molecules form cells, like this neuron here. This is, so these are atoms that form a molecule. The molecules come together. They can form a cell, and this is a very complex cell called a neuron. These are the dendrites and the cell body and the axon and axon terminals. And if you get a bunch of cells together, we have tissues. So you get a bunch of atoms together, you get molecules, get a bunch of molecules together, you have cells, you get a bunch of cells together, you have tissues. In this case, we have the brain tissue. It's not just neurons, right? So you have a lot of different tissues together. You form an organism. So an organism is dramatically different than the tissues that made up it. You get lots of the same organism together and we call that a population. You join organisms from different types it's like these little fish and this coral and this these fish and you have a community and if you join all the communities together you have the earth's biosphere the living area each one of these levels gets dramatically more complex than the previous one i'm going to provide a couple of videos for you and your homework and this concludes the first part of our lecture series. Remember, what are the major points of it? Well, obviously, the scientific method is critical for making biology a science. 
it's a hypothesis prediction testing method. Some experiments may be involved or a comparative method. We also have um, theories and hypotheses. What, how are those different and similar? We also know that the earth is very old. We have lots of different evidence for that, whether it be a geological evidence, phys uh, physics, astrophysics, or even life on its earth. When we talk about the fossil record, which we barely touched the surface of all of that, of course, not even close. But extremely intelligent people and communities have helped to figure this out. We know that uh, biology studied in a hierarchical sense, where we start with talking about molecules, and each one of these levels dramatically increases the complexity of the um, field of study. So biochemistry becomes cell biology, and cell biology becomes physiology, and physiology becomes the organisms and ecology. It's not so much that what is diff more difficult to study, it's just infinitely more complex. So this is the basics for getting us going in this field. Remember what the study of biology is, what is homeostasis. These are things I want you to think about as you write up your summary. Anyway, thank you for your attention and look forward to having you in this class. Take care.